Okay, today I want to talk a little bit more about integrated rate laws and do some worked examples of them. In a past video, I've talked about integrated rate laws kind of from a conceptual or a graphical kind of perspective. So if you have a certain time frame and you're looking at how the concentration changes, if you graph these data, then then what does that tell you about the order of the reaction? And if there's a zero order dependence on something, that means that the concentration has no impact on the rate. If there is a first order dependence, that means there's kind of this direct relationship between the concentration and the rate. So as one goes up, the other one goes up in an equal proportion. And then um, with the second order reaction, it goes up by the square of the concentration. So there's kind of more of a parabolic um, interaction. And of course, we can have other orders beyond that. But those are the most common that you see, especially in kind of more simple chemical reactions. And I don't mean simple like easy. I just mean simple, meaning less less things going on, less species present, kind of the more fundamental reactions that you run into. So um, with those um, with those relationships, then we can do um, magic calculus and we get these integrated rate laws. So that's taking the integral going from time equals zero to time equals t, whatever that is. And then this expression that we can have for each of these different orders. And um, now I want to plug some numbers in from actual um, from some actual examples that use chemical species instead of you know a's and b's and m's and n's and all the things that we usually use variable wise so i like to start off with the variables think about the math that we're doing and then we'll plug in some real numbers um, the other thing that we'll get to in this video is we'll talk a little bit about half-life which is one of the applications of these integrated rate laws so that'll be what we finish with all right so if we look at this question it says the following reaction is first order with a rate constant of 4.8 times 10 to the negative 4 per second. So there's a couple things that we can note just from that sentence. So first order means that there's a first order dependence on whatever my reactant is going to be. I can see that um, my reactant here is my dinitrogen pentoxide. So if I was going to write a rate expression just from that, it would be that the rate is equal to K times N2O5 raised to the first power. So that's kind of implied there. So I'm not going to put the one. All right, so here's my rate law expression just from that piece of it. Now it says your rate constant, which is your K, is given. So I can plug that in. So now I know that the rate is equal to 4.80 times 10 to the negative 4 per seconds, 1 over seconds, and then times the concentration of my dinitrogen pentoxide. Okay, so that's a good start. So it's saying if you start with an initial concentration, so initial concentration here is the concentration of my thing, we'll go back to variables here, at time zero, or a naught if you think about it in those kinds of terms. So concentration at time zero is given, and it's asking for the concentration, so it's asking for my a at time t, and that t is equal to 825 seconds. Okay, so I'm given a rate constant. This is my rate law expression. It's asking me to find the concentration. And since it's giving me an initial concentration, I know my rate constant, I know my time, then I can use the integrated rate law to find that. So my integrated rate law for a first order reaction has that natural log in it. And you take the ratio of whatever your concentration is of your reactant at time t, over the reactant at time zero, and that is equal to the negative kT. So that's our integrated rate law for a first order reaction. And what I'm solving for then is uh, my concentration at time t. So I'm solving for that piece of it. Now another way to write this expression is to, um, is to add the natural log of a naught to the other side. Um, so sometimes you'll see that so that it's the natural log of the concentration of a at time t is equal to the negative kt plus the ln of my concentration of a at time zero. And then we combine it like this because when you have these subtracted then you can combine those together. If you remember your natural logarithm rules, then when you're subtracting logarithms, that's the same as taking the ratio. So we're the same as dividing those, those quantities. So I kind of like it in this setup because it really shows the relationship and the ratio between them. So if you're given specific sets of information, sometimes this is the easier version to use. Sometimes in, in 
uh, examples like this one, it's easier to kind of unpack it and take it separately. And you could do that too. But um, if you wanted to think about it kind of this way where we're just sort of plugging in variables, and I know some people like to rearrange, some people like to just plug in the numbers, but ultimately kind of you're given your K, you're given your A naught, you're given your T, and when you rearrange and plug and chug for this thing, then you end up with a dinitrogen pentoxide at time T is equal to um, 1.11 times 10 to the negative 2 molarity is what I got for that. All right, so um, that's just kind of the information that you're given with these types of integrated rate laws. Again, kind of depending on your snappiness with unpacking natural logs, you can use them in a number of different formats. Um, it just really kind of depends. And if, if you have any questions on the algebra or anything, don't hesitate to reach out. Okay, let's look at another example. Let's do the same reaction. And now I'm starting with kind of my same concentration. So now how long will it take for that concentration to decrease to this other concentration? So this is kind of a nice setup for this as well. So if we think about this from the same perspective, where we have the concentration of my reactant at time t with the ratio of my concentration at time 0, that's equal to negative kt. Now from the equation, I'm given k in the prior in the prior um, question, so my k was still equal to my 4.80 times 10 to the negative fourth per seconds. This is my initial concentration, so this is my a at time 0. It's asking how long will it take, so I'm looking for t, so I'm looking for a time, and then this is going to be my concentration at time t whatever that is. So now again, it's just a plug and chug operation. So I have my concentration at time t. This is what I want to do here. This is what I started with. That ratio will go here. You take the natural log, divide that by the negative k, and that'll give you the t. So when you do plug that in, you end up with your t is equal to 1.04 times 10 to the third seconds. So that's quite a long time. Now you can kind of see that this is a pretty useful equation and these integrated rate laws are really useful in terms of kind of lab experience or industry because if you think about what you're starting with and you have a target amount that you're trying to get to or there's a target amount you're trying to produce then just like our talks about stoichiometry really early on any mechanism we can have to figure out how much is going to be left over at the end, how much is going to be produced, um, given a certain set of data. So given that we know something about the kinetics of the reaction and we know something about that rate law constant, then that gives us a way to predict the behavior of a system. And as scientists, that gets us really excited, right? We really like to be able to predict behaviors of things and then to test them to see if we can make uh, processes more efficient or to see if we really do understand the mechanisms by with which this reaction is occurring, that kind of thing. All right, so just another integrated rate law. Now a cool application, as I promised, is half-life. The half-life as a symbol is usually that lowercase t, which we use for time. We use the lowercase t for time as opposed to the uppercase t, the capital T, for temperature, for absolute temperature. So that's kind of the difference there in terms of symbols. So when you have this lowercase t sub one-half here, then that indicates that it's a half-life. And a half-life is the amount of time that it takes for half of the concentration of something to decay. Now usually we associate that, and I get kind of excited about nuclear chemistry, so if you've seen some of my other videos I get into nuclear chemistry in more detail, but this is often associated with some sort of radioactive decay, and a lot of the ways that we see half-life in terms of media or you know video games, those kinds of things, they usually have to do with radioactive fallout, uh, radioactive decay, that kind of thing. And the length of time, then, the longer the half-life, the more stable the thing is, because it just takes longer for it to radioactively decay, which means that it's safer for us. So that's a good thing. But um, it can also apply to other reactions. We could talk about the half-life of my dinitrogen pentoxide that I was just using in that decomposition reaction. So recall that a decomposition reaction is going from one reactant to multiple products, 
So the amount of time it takes for half of that sample to decompose would be considered a half-life. We could also talk about it in terms of metabolism. So if I'm thinking about how long a drug is going to stay in my system, so if I take some Tylenol in the morning for my headache, and um, I want to know kind of when I'm going to have to take another Tylenol, right? That's how those different um, those time frames are estimated. You know, you see these different drugs where you can take them every four hours or every eight hours. Those timelines are based on their half-life in your body, how long it takes for your body to process them, and then when you can take the next dose in order to keep the dose in your system at a certain concentration. So these are all sort of interconnected in terms of applications. So for our first order reaction, the half-life is the same equation that we've been using in our other examples. But now what we're trying to calculate is the amount of time, so we're looking for this guy, it takes for my A sub T, so my concentration at time T, to be half of the initial concentration. So at what time does this occur? And that's the definition of half-life is, is when does this concentration equal half of what I started with? So if I plug this in to my natural log here, and I have one half of my a naught or my a sub zero over my a sub zero is equal to negative kT, then now I can get rid of my concentrations here. This is the natural log of one half. I can divide that by my negative k, and that gives me my t here. And now, now this t is my half-life t, okay? So that's the amount of time it takes for half of my sample to, to decay. And this k needs to be known, or I can figure out my k if I'm given a half-life, so it's kind of one or the other. This is, of course, again, for a first-order reaction, because I use that integrated rate law for the first order. But it would have different forms depending on the uh, the kinetics of the reaction that we're looking at. A lot of radioactive decay falls in first order kind of kinetics, um, but you will see things that aren't. So I'm going to give you those equations as well, just to give you a general sense of that. Now the natural log of one half is negative 0.693, and then if you divide that by a negative, then you'll get a positive number. So another way that you can write this is with the actual numbers themselves, where the half life is equal to positive 693 over k. So 0.693 over the rate law constant is going to give you the half-life. And that's just kind of a really snappy way to do that. OK, so let me tell you a little bit about this format for other orders of the reaction here. So this is first order. If I have a zero order process, I'm just going to give you the take home message here and not do the derivation to save on time a little bit. For a zero order, the half-life is equal to the initial concentration, so the concentration at time zero over 2k. So again, you need to know the rate law constant. You need to know that it's a zero order process. And for zero order processes, the rate is equal to the rate law constant because there's no dependence on this concentration. So you just need to know how much you started off with and what the constant is. And now my second order, is uh, going to be an inverse, sort of like we saw with the integrated rate laws in general. It's sort of the inverse of things. So my t sub 1 half here, my half-life, is equal to 1 over the rate law constant times the initial concentration. So that's going to be the equation that you use there. So that's kind of handy. OK, so um, these are kind of nice ways, good application. Kind of a cool way to do it if you're looking for half-life then this is a little bit of a shortcut or if it asks you how much time it takes for something to be reduced by half then the implication is that it's asking you for half-life so then you can use this if you're given information about what you started with and what that constant is um, or vice versa if you're given the time which can be in seconds or minutes or years or however length of time it is depending on the stability of the thing then you can solve for the other pieces. Maybe how much did I start with? If I know that I have a specific K and it's been happening for 2,000 years, right? So you could kind of back out how much of it was present at a given time. You know, how much uh, iron was present um, 2,000 years ago? That would be sort of an interesting way to use this, right? Okay, if you have any questions on this, don't hesitate to reach out. Um, otherwise, I'll talk to you again soon.